Praise the Lord. And that is so true. Can never thank God enough for the grace. Amen. It's good to see you this morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> I love this time of year with all the allergies and pollen and everything else, don't you? Praise the Lord. This morning we have another deacon that we're going to ordain. If you men will make your way to the front. Bill Robinson was not able to be here for our ordination last time, so we made a special exception. Amen. 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 He's brought with him some prayer partners who are going to stand behind him and just a moment, they'll begin to pray for him. But deacon ministry is, is, a, is an important ministry in our fellowship. And we shared with you, we ordained our last group of deacons how important it was. And the process of putting it all together has been. Elders have structured this thing as close to New Testament ministry as you can have in a church. And their role, Bill, your role, would be get to work. Amen? So <laughs> it's a servant role in our church. But it's also to encourage you to be servants in the Lord as well. And these men uh, are entering into a ministry that I believe will be a blessing to the church, and we're praying that the church will be a blessing to them as well. So as they begin to pray for Bill, I want to pray for him just as well. But you gentlemen, if you'll begin to pray, I have a few more words I want to just say to the congregation. All our leadership in the church, it's very important that you do pray. I hope that you have on your prayer list uh, deacon ministry and our lift leaders ministry and our pastoral ministry, all those who are serving the Lord in so many different areas. We need your prayers. We lay our hands on people like this. It's a biblical uh, representation of how the Lord has laid his hand upon us. And so as we lay our hands and pray for people and anoint them in, in this way, it's to show what God has done for our lives and when he calls us to service. He's pulled us out. He's selected us. It doesn't make you any better than anybody else in, in this regard. Some people put a title with their name in the church and they think it makes them better than someone. That's not the, the role nor the place nor the intention that these people are called out as servants to the Lord. And called out to serve the Lord. These men who are gathered around him are other ordained areas of ministry, whether deacons or elders, and they're prayer partners and have committed themselves not only to pray for Bill, but hopefully they continue to pray for Bill as well. And I'm going to ask you to do the same today. So as they continue to pray with your heads bowed, we just pray for all our leadership within our fellowship, but pray for Bill this morning as well as, as he is set apart for this particular ministry to the Lord and for the Lord. We praised God for people who have a heart to serve. So just lift him up to the Lord right now and lift those who serve here up to the Lord. Father, how we love you today and how we thank you that you've given us this privilege of being used by you, of being in service to you. And Lord, I know that you've called us all to serve you. There's also different offices within the church, Lord, that you raise people up and you put within them a desire to serve you in this capacity. Lord, the people who come and stand before our congregation like this are people who, who feel, feel a call in their heart from you. And as you've given that desire, God, we know that you also give us the power that we need to serve you. And Lord, the fortitude that it takes. So I pray, Lord, for all our deacons and for Bill today, Father, that you'd continue to encourage them, bless them, fill them with your spirit, use them for your glory. God, the ministries that are out there in this fellowship that they will be serving you in, God, I pray that you will give them discernment and wisdom as they march forward with them. And Father, the strength to carry out whatever task it is you lay for, out for them to do. Our desire, Lord, as we lay our hands on Bill this morning as a church, is that you'll raise him up, Father, use him for your glory. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. And I think, Gary, you have a certificate to give to... <laughs> Gary serves as our chairman of deacons. So if you've got a problem with a deacon, get a hold of Gary. Amen. But God, praise the Lord again. Amen. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Bill, and God bless you. As they return to their seats, I want to remind you something about our ladies' uh, retreat that's coming up. If you'll come to go to that slide for me, please, real quick. Uh, this is the last Sunday. Those who are thinking about going to our ladies' retreat, for you to get the opportunity to get a discount. It's called the early bird discount or whatever it is, but it does give you a discount. I'm praying that you have already made a commitment to go. We've just returned recently from our men's retreat, and those of you who are a part of that, you men know the kind of revival fire that God starts up. In fact, this, some of the important ministries that we do, probably at the top of all that we do, are these retreats for our, our men's ministries, our youth retreats, our, our pastoral staff retreats, our, our, our women's retreats. They're all for the reason, first and foremost, to rebuild a fire in us. This is a time, ladies, you can get away, be with some women that love God, be under godly teaching. Phyllis Moore is so anointed by the Lord. I've known Phyllis and her husband, John, for as long as I've been saved, just about. I think I met them about a year after I got saved. There are such stalwart forces in the kingdom. God uses them greatly. And Phyllis is such an anointed woman of God. She has a ministry that you're going to be blessed by, and I believe God's going to stir you up to a new unction. 
I don't know, maybe you've made an excuse why you're not going, or maybe you plan on going, whatever it is. Take a moment today to just really reconsider if you've decided you weren't going, and think about that. God's got something for you. People have been praying, people have been preparing, and so, so there's really no excuse. And if you think, well, I don't have any money. Hey, in fact, we're having one today. We do a few fundraisers in our women's ministry, and one will be having lunch right after church. And by the way, it's a lot cheaper than going anywhere else. We're having a, a Mexican taco lunch right after church. And so uh, that money that comes in from that, I think it's like $5 a person, $20 a family, but the money that comes in for that goes right into helping some ladies who possibly cannot really afford to go, offsets their expenses with that. So when you go through the lunch line, you can pay a little more than five bucks, right? You give that for a tip sometimes. Some of you do, all right? <laughs> but hey, ladies, this is an opportunity. Don't let this pass. I pray you men would encourage your ladies to go and be a part of this retreat. It, it, it is a life-transforming, life-changing time in the Lord, so don't miss this particular opportunity, amen, to, to serve the Lord. Well, I had a sermon outline at one time. There it is. <laughs> I am going to be preaching on a, as we continue in our series on the miracles of Jesus today. And this is an important kind of time as we've gone through the miracles of Jesus. This is part six, and part six is in John chapter five where Jesus uh, heals the lame man by the pool of Bethesda. And this is an important time in, in, the, in the progress of these miracles. Like I said before, I'm trying to do these in as much a chronological order as I can figure out. We take the Gospels and lay them out and try to, where's Jesus, what's going on, where's the ministry? So we kind of lay out where he's at, when he's at, and where these miracles are occurring during the, the, the length of his ministry that he had. So as we've looked at them, we've discovered first and foremost that the word miracle in Scripture really translates into what we would say a good English word, better than miracle, literally in the Greek the word means a sign. They were, yes, I'm not taking away the fact, they are supernatural interventions, all right? God moves in and does the unexpected, the impossible, and the supernatural. So I'm not, I'm not taking away that at all. But it is a word which literally means sign. So every miracle is a sign. It, it, it verifies, testifies, uh, attests to the fact that Jesus is who he says he is. He's the Christ. He's the long-awaited Messiah. He is the Son of God. He's God in the flesh. You know, as one man said, for only God could do these things. That's what one of the scribes said, remember? So we've seen the fact that these miracles uh, testify to the fact that Jesus is Messiah. These first miracles, as we looked at them, the first five, we've seen that Jesus came for a specific purpose. And each miracle kind of reveals what that is, how he came, one, to verify that he's come to save the world. He, he comes and he shows that he's able to make a difference. He changes the water into wine. He transforms lives, all right? And so we see that they have a, yeah, there's a spiritual truth and a miracle that happens, but there is also this spiritual application that we can make from that miracle. There's a teaching, there's a lesson, there's principles to learn. And it kind of changes right here in the way the Lord's dealing in how, how it's working in, in regard to these miracles. The first four chapters, or look about the first six or seven miracles, if lay them out in chronologically, show that Jesus is who he says he is, but also testifies the fact of his ministry, to come, to seek, to save that which is lost, and even underscores it by the miracle of the fishes where he calls the first of his disciples to become fishers of men. So we see each one of these is unique, all right? And in the context of the way they, where they are in Scripture, the meaning uh, has uh, significant things. Now, as you move into John chapter 5, and we look at this lame man at the pool of Bethesda, uh, you see a little different movement taking place. Here's a man who's lame for 38 years. He's been by the pool of Bethesda, and Jesus comes on the scene, and he heals this man. So the application kind of changes today if, and, uh, from the way I read Scripture, and, and I've, I've talked to even some uh, uh, deans of seminaries that have kind of agreed with me on the way this works and the way this seems to appear to me, that now it seems instead of just those miracles saying, hey, I've come to make... Old people knew, all right? Uh, the old nature can be changed. You know, the water of your life can be turned into the sweet wine of God's grace, you know? So he makes a change. But now you see it, so like the miracles seem to have a different application. He's speaking to his people in this regard to, to the church. And it's like, here's a man. He's laying by the pool of Bethesda, but he doesn't seem to be able to, to, to stand up. He's, he's, he's paralyzed from his, from his waist down. He has legs but they don't take him anywhere. He has legs, but he can't stand up. He has legs, but he can't walk. And there's a lot of people in church like that. They've come to Christ, they've prayed a prayer, they've committed their heart to Jesus Christ, but it seems like they're just paralyzed 
in their spiritual walk. They seem like there's no unction to function, as we say. They, they just are not growing in the Lord. They're, they seem to be stagnant in their spiritual walk in life. It's, it's like, I remember sharing with the church one time in, in revival, I said, you know, if we were to take the congregation and divide it up into spiritual age groups, all right, not physically, but spiritual, where you are in the Lord, most people would either have to go to the nursery or children's church. Because, isn't that true? Because there's not a lot of spiritual depth in people's lives, and I think the problem is exactly in John chapter 5, it reveals what the problem is. And here's a man who has the, the, the equipment, but doesn't have the capacity. He has, the, he has the, 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 the legs, but there doesn't seem to be any life in the legs, and there's no power in the legs. When we come to Christ, he makes us a new creature. But it, how is it that so many people read the Bible, and they, they see where it says, hey, we're new creatures in Christ, we're old man's passed away, we're victorious in Jesus, we're champions for Christ, but you know, they're living more like chumps for Christ than champions. It, and I don't mean that in a derogatory sense, but in, in a sense of reality, they just don't have, you know, what it takes. Now, if you're the kind of person who, when you, when you hear the pastor preach, open your Bible and pins a little note by the text, you'll probably notice that I preached from this text about a year and a half ago. All right? In fact, I look back, because I keep a list of everything I've preached for 25 years. And I look back over the last 25 years of ministry here, and when I preach this message today, this will be the sixth time I've preached it from this text in our congregation over 25 years. Now, to be quite honest with you, I have preached this sermon over 100 times from this text, probably closer to 300 times in my ministry throughout the years. When I would go to a church to just do revivals, not the crusades, but when we were working in a, in a fellowship and just preaching to the church body, every revival I think I ever did in my life, I preached from this particular text. Many times the church would bring me in just for a Sunday morning service. They couldn't handle any more than that. <laughs> I would preach from this text. This has been one of the most life-transforming texts for me of the miracles of Jesus that I have personally preached from. Since I had preached from it five previous times, I almost didn't preach from it this morning. In fact, I went ahead and prepared the next miracle in, in, in the series. And I was going to preach from that. But the Lord kept bringing me back to this and said, you know, I was kind of like, why aren't you preaching? Well, I've heard this. Then the Lord reminded me, hey, you've preached it 300 times and you still need it. <laughs> so you can be sure that we need it. The principles that are laid out in this miracle that you see, the applications are so simple, they are profound. It is a passage which I say the first time I heard anybody preach from it, God just really spoke, spoke to my heart. So I'm preaching just from my own heart today and from my life messages as well as from an outline. But I, and, and part of the reason is because there are a lot of people in church today who are like this in their spiritual life. There's this impotence, all right? And you could even title this. I used to title this message, the, the Master's Method for Making Men Whole. That's clever, right? But then I thought a better title would be the impotent man meets the omnipotent man. And here's a guy who doesn't have the power to stand. And he meets the man with all power the Lord of glory, the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we get into the gospel, John chapter 5 is where we'll start, about 14 verses, and uh, it's kind of a play-by-play -play of what's happening as Jesus comes up to Jerusalem for a feast. It doesn't say which one at this time. It says, after these things, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda. By that means, it means house of grace or, you know, house of mercy. Having five porticos, and in these lay a multitude of those who were sick and blind and lame and withered and waiting. Sounded like a Baptist church for sure, doesn't it? <laughs> for the moving of the waters. For an angel of the Lord went down at a certain season to the pool and stirred up the water. And whoever then first, after the stirring of the water, stepped in was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted. A man was there who had been ill for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lie there, he knew he'd already been there a long time in that condition. And he said to him, do you wish to get well? King James Version says, wilt thou be made whole? Well, the sick man answered, sir, I have no man to put me in the pool. When the water stirred up but while I'm coming, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, you get up, pick up your pallet and walk. And immediately the man became well and picked up his pallet and began to walk. And it was on the Sabbath on that day. So... When the Jews were saying to the man who was cured, it's Sabbath, it's not permissible for you to carry your pallet. And he answered them, 
He who made me well was the one who said to me, pick up your pallet and walk. And I'm just doing what I was told, all right? They asked him, well, who is this man who said to you, pick up your pallet and walk? Catch this. But the man who was healed did not know who it was. For Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd in that place. And afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, you become well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. Now, this is a miraculous event. I don't want to take that. This is a miracle moment. Now, the original manuscripts don't have this part about the angel coming down uh, and stirring the water, although that's what they're waiting for. So whatever it was, whether that actually happened or not, this is the reason that they're gathered here, so that they're waiting for the water to be stirred. And whenever it's stirred, it seems that whoever is let down first or gets in the pool first, they're made whole from whatever disease would afflict them. And here's this man who's been there 38 years. He can't walk and he's he's waiting for the moving the water along with it says, well, a great multitude. There's a whole bunch of people here, you know, and as they're lying around waiting for the stirring of the water. And I I don't know. I I mean, it's it's in this the manuscript, some of the manuscripts and it's not in some of the others. But uh, someone said it was added later for clarification why everybody's at the pool. All right. And why they's waiting. Nonetheless. It's written that, that an angel stirred. Now, there is in Revelation, by the way, I think it's Revelation 15 or 16, what uh, an angel called the angel of the water. And the, what happens is during the time of the tribulation when all the people have taken the mark, God begins to curse these people. And the, remember, the waters turn to blood and everything that's in the sea dies and the rivers turn to blood. And, 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 and it says something like this. And the angel of the, of the water said unto God, you've done well, they deserved it. Well, that's pretty powerful, isn't it? So there's this angel of the water, whether it's this angel or not. We don't know. A little background is all I can give you at this particular point. But what we want to focus on is the fact that God does something supernatural in this event to change a man's life forever. And it's, it's unique the way the scriptures approach it. Because here is Jesus. He comes up to Jerusalem for the feast and he comes into this place. Now, Jesus has been up to Jerusalem probably at least once a year all his life, being a good Jew, if not more often. So he's up there and he sees this man. In fact, most likely this guy is the worst case around the pool. Okay, he's he's in the baddest shape of anybody. Jesus knows he's been there a long time and he's struggling and he's frustrated and he feels hopeless because, you know, uh, everybody around the pool hadn't learned pool etiquette yet. You know, uh, so he's he, nobody he, other step down before he can get there. And so Jesus comes up to him and really the Lord just speaks to him three times in this passage. And the, it's, as he speaks to him, the first time the Lord speaks to him, he, you know, he, he asks him a question. Do you want to be made well? Stupid question. Some would think Jesus doesn't ask stupid questions. All right. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. I've been asked stupid questions. One of my favorite stupid questions is when you're sitting in the emergency room for about three or four hours. And then finally, some side, he says, can I help you? Yeah. You like that one? Or perhaps you've been working out in the yard or something. You bust your thumb with a nail and a hammer, you know. Somebody asks, oh, did that hurt? No, I just like hitting myself and watching the blood gush. Yeah. <laughs> stupid. We all get asked stupid questions, you know. So... Uh, I, We don't want to get stuck on this, but the idea is the Lord speaks to him and he asks him a question. The second thing he does, he tells him to get up. He basically gives him a command. The third thing he does, he finds him later in the temple and he warns him about what's going on in his life. And he warns him about the, about the, the walk that he has now and how he should use that walk for, for the glory of God, that you go sin no more, lest a worse thing should come unto you. So let's just kind of go through these three points real quick and look at them. And I want you to see, and, and if, if you're willing today, if there's a desire as he deals with this first thing, hold your own life up to this passage of Scripture and see what God would say to you. Maybe you feel incapacitated in your spiritual life or some area of your spiritual life where you feel like you just keep losing the battle, I believe God would have a word for us today in this regard. And I believe it's a good word. And, and the last thing we need to do is to shun it. Some people, they don't know how to handle a word from God. We use the word conviction, you know. Uh, y'all, y'all familiar that word when the Holy Spirit convicts you? In other words, when conviction comes, the Lord is dealing with you about something that's not right in your life. Why? So you can get right, but it's not just to get right. It's so you can, it's, it's kind of like you go to the doctor to, to, to deal with the disease, the poison, the sin. What, what, what is it? You want to get rid of that so you can be healthy. And a lot of people have this bad idea about conviction. that When God speaks to their heart and convicts them about something, they're like, oh, that's terrible. I, I've heard people be negative and make remarks about some of my priests. Well, it's just too convicting. 
Listen, I go to the doctor, I want a two convicted doctor, all right, to deal with me, to really get down to the core of what I'm dealing with and resolve my problem. So it's good. And I don't know about you, I, you know, I, I need somebody to straighten me up weekly, so I, I preach these to myself when I preach them to you. I, I, I believe that most of us need a good little, you know, shake by the nap of our necks and say, hey, wake up and fly straight. Amen? And it's people who don't want that to become dangerous to themselves and become a hindrance to their own walk. So be willing to hold yourself up to the mirror of the Word of God, as James says. The Lord starts, first of all, with desire. That's what this question is all about. Do you really want me to do something in your life? Do you really want to be made whole? And the word for well there is the way the King James translates it. It has to do with wholeness, all right? Completion. Do you, do you want to be made complete? Do you want to be made whole? And, and, and it's like there's this probing question that comes. And to the man, I'm sure, maybe for a moment, he acts, well, that's about the dumbest thing I've ever heard. But it's more than just a casual question. Do you really want God to do something in your life? That's a valid question. Because and I, I know, I know, we've been in church a long time. Oh, that's me. I want God to do something in my life. Hey, before you raise your hands and jump up and say that, I want you to think about a couple of things. Because sometimes, just because we know the right answer doesn't mean we really feel that way about it. There's two things in this passage that kind of st that come out to me first and foremost. One, and this is what the, I think this is why the question comes, you know, before we answer it, we need to consider the responsibility that becoming whole involves. All right? Let's look at it from this man's standpoint. 38 years. He's been a long time in this case, right? I mean, that's, that's not overnight. It's not by the week. This is 38 long years, 38 hard years of living like this, 38 years with this particular handicap in his life, 38 years, and it's not like we have some modern technology and, and, and all the things we, from the simplest thing like a wheelchair in those days, uh, 38 years he's had to depend on everybody around him. For 38 years he's not able to go to the kitchen and cook his own meal. For 38 years he can't go get himself a glass of water. For 38 years he can't even go out and get the morning newspaper. All right? But when his life changes, and it's about to change, it's going to change in a dramatic way. 38 years, somebody's picked him up and brought him to the pool, whatever it might be. Hey, now things are going to be different. Now he's going to have to assume some responsibilities in his life. Now there's going to have to be some disciplines in his life. Now, and maybe you think, well, yeah, he wants that. And I don't know if that's true in the spiritual world for a lot of folks, though. Now it's going to be different. Now the world changes for us. If we're really going to step forward and say, Lord, I want to be what you want me to be. Well, I want you to know as much as you want that, God wants that. And you're going to have to get to this point where you, you, you can't say, well, and, and we sing this in songs sometimes. I know it just kind of thing, just kind of hair on my neck stands up because it's so stupid. It's like, make me love you. Make me. God's not going to make you. All right? We want God to make us be prayer warriors, make us to love the Bible, make us, to, you know. Now, there are choices we have to make if we're going to be anything for God. Hey, there's choices you're going to have to make if you're going to be anything in life. Amen? It's not any different in your spiritual walk in life. There are decisions, there's responsibilities that if I'm going to grow, then I have to get into the milk of the Word. If I'm going to grow beyond that past infancy, i got to begin to go deeper in the Word and desire the meat of the Word. All right. There's choices that are going to have to be made. I want God to do something in my family. I need to pray. I need to read the word. I need to believe the word of God. I want God to do something in my in my community, in my state, in my nation, in the world. Then it's, it's, it requires more than just sitting around and saying, well, Lord, make it me happen and make revival come and make people know. I've got to get out and do something. There's some choices. And here's the thing about it. God empowers those, by the way. All right. But it will involve some responsibilities. And it's, it's silly for us to sit around and expect God to do something when we're not willing to make some volitional decisions, choices in our lives ourselves. Oh, I want to be mature in Christ, but I'm not going to read the Bible. I want to be mature in Christ, but I'm not going to study it. I want to be mature, but I'm not going to spend any time with God. I want to be mature in Christ, but I ain't got time to pray. Are you with me still? Now, I didn't say this was the easiest message to listen to. But it's such a needed word. Responsibility. Are we willing to say, when I stand up on my legs, am I willing to move forward then? Am I willing to make a difference in the world I'm in? Because it is a big issue here. And so, you know, Jesus is asking, do you really want me to do something? Now, at this point, he blames somebody. Well, pff, there's a bunch of rude people around me. I, I want to come. I want to get a pool. But nobody, you know, somebody pff, right there, before, every time somebody gets out in front of me. 
How many have the same kind of mindset? Oh, I really want to be something for God, but boy, my wife. Oh, or my husband. He just doesn't get it. Or my kids. They're like little demons sometimes. And, I, you know, if it wasn't for them, if it... If it just, if they just act, I could be a better person. I could be a better Christian. And what we have to realize, no, 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 you got it backwards. It's all the more reason to be godly when you have these things going on in your life. Amen? It's all the more reason to step up. Believe the Lord. Trust the Lord. So first of all, there is this issue of responsibility. And the truth of the matter is that keeps a lot of people back because, you know, uh, you know uh, well, I don't have to tell anybody about Jesus if I don't know how. That's why some people, you know, you announce, hey, we're having an evangelism class. How do we win people Jesus? La, 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 <laughs> la. Can't do it. Don't know how. Uh, that's belaboring that point enough. But hey, there's a response. But the second thing about this decision before yes, amen, is just consider what it really is to be made complete and to be made whole. Because most of us aren't interested in wholeness. We're really interested in partial cures. Fix my dilemma. Take care of my problem. Fix that child of mine, that spouse of mine. You know, it's, it's kind of like, fix it. When Jesus comes to him, he doesn't say, do you want me to fix your legs? Is that what he asked? I have two legs, I do them good. I'm a leg guy, <laughs> you're done. You know, he didn't say that, did he? Do you, want, do you want to be made whole? Do you want to be made complete is the word here. Do you want to be made full? And the question is an important question. Because a lot of people aren't interested in wholeness. Remember, uh, week before last when I was preaching, I talked about giving the, the Lord our lives, like giving Him this book, you know. Pretend for a moment this is not a Bible, but it, it, it's your life. And when you come to Christ, you say, here's, here's everything I am. I'll, I'll just give it to you. And, and then we talked about how He starts turning the pages and He starts dealing with issues that are and to grow us in Christ. And there's, if there's things on, my, in, on this page that aren't like Jesus, then He'll deal with it. So I can turn back and keep walking through the book and becoming more like Christ. But a lot of people, they're not interested in that. They, they want God to fix something. A lot of people come to the altar because, you know, they, they have an issue. I, I'm not even a problem with that. I mean, we pray about issues all the time. But this whole matter, first and foremost, has to be about your, your, your whole commitment, your whole heart, your, your whole life. Lord, here I am. This is who I am. I, I, I need to be made whole. It's not about fix my back and fix my problem and fix my, my, my situation here. Take care of this dilemma. No. There's wholeness involved here. And the, so the Lord asked this question. So you see, it's more than just a simple question or a dumb question. It's, he's probing. Now, the second thing we talked about was, first of all, desire. And then comes this issue that Jesus deals with about obedience. Take up your bed and walk. Now, understand, the beauty of this is, if you, when you follow the scriptures, uh, Jesus doesn't sit down beside the guy and kind of start sympathizing. Oh, man, I hear you. There's people like that in the world everywhere you go, man. You know, it's just, it's just hard, you know. There's always going to be people stepping in line in front of you, and you just can't let that bother you. I mean, you need to have a better attitude, you know. And we're, you know, just kind of, you know, uh, you, you, know you, you, you can do better in life, and you can be a better person. And so I want you to just, you know, just to take, the, you know, take a chill pill and realize there are people like that, and you just, you know. No. And he doesn't sit down and say, oh, you poor baby. Oh, man, I, you know, I've been coming to Jerusalem for a while. I'm 30 years old. I spent some time up here when I was 12. Remember talking to the Pharisees up at the temple? I remember seeing you here. You got a bad idea. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that this has happened to you, and it's really bad. And it's, it's... Now, Jesus does show mercy, all right, and he is a sympathetic shepherd. He's been touched with our infirmities, but that's not what he focuses on here. He just says, it's time to get up. And take up your bed and walk. The issue here gets down to this, you know, not do I need sympathy, not do I need to, to you know, be able to express my feelings in this situation and tell all the problems and why, this, why, why is these things happening to me. And, hey, Jesus said, you know, get up. There's this issue, first desire, and then there's issue, oh, this, the pool, basically. This man has to give up his hope in the pool. And there's a lot of folks today who have a pool out there. 
It may be a pool of popularity. If I could just be accepted on the job or at school, if I could be the prom queen or king or whatever, if everybody loved me, that'd be great. I'd be happy if this boy would pay attention to me or this girl would like me. Hey, it'd be, be marvelous. That's, that's what I need. If I just had that, I'd be happy. And you get a little bit down the road, then it's, oh, I need, to, I need this job or this career. And if I could just make that, if I could just get, be accepted, if I could just be on the team, if they'd just make me a leader, if they'd just put me in charge, if I could just be the boss, if I could just make more money, if I just had a bigger house, I need a boat, I have a car, if I have all these things. You know, if I could just get that and wrap my hand, then I know if just the woman in my dream, if I could just have her or him, then I know I would be happy. Really happy. And how many people get all that stuff in the pool, so to say, and they're still empty? Because there's no satisfaction in the pool life. It's always found in the Jesus life. So many people go through their whole life before they learn this lesson. There's not stuff, and it's not things, and it's not acceptance, and you're going to have to do the same thing that this man did. Get your eye off the pool. And other people who might be in the way of you getting in the pool. Well, my daddy left when I was just a little boy. My mama didn't love me. And I, hey, I'm sure that was hard. It's difficult. But you're going to have to get your eyes off all those things with no excuses anymore. You say, Lord, God, I need you, and I'm willing to submit my life to you to do what you call me to do. Amen. And people do it in church, you know. Well, you know, if they just recognize me at church, I can sing so well, and they just don't recognize it. And if I could just sing, then I'd be, you know, oh, you'd probably be a wreck. If I could just teach or preach, or if I had a certain spiritual gift, if I just had the gift of this or the gift of that, then I'd, uh, it's, it's all the same. It's all the same. What we need more than anything else is just Jesus being Jesus and Lord and King and our love relationship on fire and fervent and radical for Him. Yeah. Quit rationalizing all the reasons we are not what we should be and ex making excuses for not what we, what we should be and just say, Lord, here I am. Yes, I do want to be made whole. What do you want me to do? Amen. What's next? Where am I in this relationship? In fact, if I look in any other place than Him in my life, I always find I'm disappointed. I'm always, I'm always getting frustrated when I look in other avenues, you know. So first thing, you know, take up your bed and walk. Now, as we gave you a couple of things about the issue of, of desire and, and con to consider. Well, there's a couple of things in regard to this issue of obedience. First thing, I'm clicking, I'm clicking the wrong one. There we go. So there's two things I want to show you here. The first thing about this obedience was, hey, it is impossible. There is a miracle. Don't get over that. And it, it's a miracle to live for Jesus. It's, God gives you miraculous strength. God gives you miraculous grace, all right? So when you sit down and you say, well, I can't because, hey, that doesn't fly with Jesus because he's the God of all power. Remember, he's the omnipotent one. And if I'll trust him, then I can find myself doing what I didn't think I could be doing. I can find myself talking what I didn't think I could talk about. I can find myself being what I didn't think I could be. I can find myself forgiving what I didn't think I could forgive. I can find myself loving what I didn't think I could love. I can find myself soul winning when I didn't think I could soul win. I'll find myself giving when I didn't think I could be a giver. Get up! And do what? Whatever he says. This situation. Take up that thing that you've been in bondage to all your life. You've had to live in that bed. Now I want you to pick it up. You take authority over it. Yeah, it's a miracle. And what makes this miracle a reality? I mean, we're at this, this, this climactic moment in this life. To be healed, all they have to do is just stand up. Oh, well, you know, can you imagine Peter sitting and saying, Lord, Jesus, just a minute. He's crippled. <laughs> he can't get up. He's crippled. I know. I know his mom, his dad. I've seen him. You know, I've been, I lived here a lot. Well, I, he's here all the time. You think he'd be here if he wasn't this way? No, he can't get up. But isn't that the excuses we use? Why can't? Because it's impossible. Ha! Hear the master, meet the master. That which is impossible becomes possible with his presence and with his word. Amen. Amen. That's, the power, that's the power of the word of God. In other words, when Jesus says, do this, it meant he could. Jesus says, get up, that means you can. Jesus says, stop, that means you can. Jesus says, start, that means you can. Jesus says, speak, means you can. Jesus says, shut up, that means you can. You know, it's kind of like, uh, help me, I'm talking, I can't shut up. <laughs> yes, you can. The grace of God. And so it's impossible, but it becomes, it becomes possible by the, by the power of the word of God and by the presence of Jesus. Second thing is, he didn't, he didn't dilly-dally around to make excuses, he's got up. And it's time for 
us, when God deals with us, it's the same way today. If you hear his voice, it's the day of salvation. For some to be saved to know Christ, for others to experience the salvation in their life in a genuine way. When he speaks, do it. Quit, quit, quit rationalizing and justifying and looking at people and measuring yourself by other situations or by other people. Hey, just get up. Well, I don't feel like getting up yet. You don't wait till you feel like it. Your feelings are not God's gift to your nervous system, all right? You have to make a choice. And you can't say, well, you know, but, but I just don't feel like it. You know, most people, unfortunately, live their whole Christian life like that. I don't want to go to church today. I don't feel like it. I'm tired. Football game starts early. I'm playing golf. I don't feel like it. Big baby. And again, they do your feelings. It has everything to do with your will. This goes beyond emotion. And there are times when I emotionally feel like serving the Lord. Hey, there's times I don't. Guys said, wake up this morning. I didn't want to. I didn't feel like getting out of bed. This remind me I'm the pastor and I had a little something to do get me up. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of times you don't feel like it. But you know, if, if this is the way you live your spiritual life, you'll never grow in grace. You won't read your Bible until oh, I think I feel like reading my Bible. You won't pray until I feel like praying. You won't tell G to about anybody about Jesus until you feel I, I think it'd be a good day to me. What a miserable way to exist. This comes to the point of maturity again. I'm saying, I will be what God's I'm just going to choose. And, and here's the thing about it I know I can't do it, but I know He can. Yes. So that when I do trust Him and choose to step out with this, it's really what faith is, is it not? Faith without what is dead. Faith without works. So and this choice of, of, of standing up, so to say, in his situation is what brought about the miracle. Go. Stand up. Walk. Anything else, as I said before at this point? The last point is pretty simple. Remember, Jesus looks him up in the temple later. And there's this obligation. And by the way, isn't it interesting? It says that when he stood up, grabbed up his bed. Apparently, he's having a party at this point. Legs, you know. And I don't think he got up. You know, all wobbly legs like this. My muscles are in atrophy, you know, whatever. He stood up, and he picked up his bed, and he began to walk. Now, when the Pharisees stopped, he said, you can't carry your bed on the Sabbath. Yes. He told me to. He's the Lord of the Sabbath, by the way. He told me. Who? I don't know. And I just want to stop and make this one point. I believe there are times that we all experience just like this man where God comes in, does something supernatural, and we didn't even know it was God. I believe some of you would be, if not all of you, all of us would probably be dead today if it wasn't for an intervention of God's grace, probably on multiple occasions. If not dead, in jail. <laughs> Amen. But God just moved in, boom, did something, and was gone. You're, you're so excited about what he did, you don't know who it was that did it. But... And this is a lot of times the things that bring us to Jesus in the beginning. The Bible says, you know, it's the grace of God. You know, it's the kindness and the goodness of God that draws men to repentance. And we begin to look at our life and see the times when, you know, when, when we saw these deliverances and these acts of grace. And, hey, realize that somebody else is involved in my life other than me. And maybe I am where I am because God's trying to speak to me and God's trying to deal with my heart. And now it's time to pay attention. So here's the thing about it. Jesus finds him. And this is the great thing about a gracious shepherd and our heavenly father. He will look you up. And he says to him, don't sin anymore. Now, we've been preaching on Wednesday nights on the reasons we have maladies and trials and sicknesses and things like this. And we've talked about that sometimes we have them because of sickness. Not every time, but there are times in our life because of sickness we're being chastened by God. And we're going through things that we shouldn't have to if we've just been obedient Right? And so the Lord comes, but the Lord doesn't chasten us to, to, to get back at us. You know? Now, our parents kind of be, you have to be careful not to be guilty of this because your child doesn't say, well, I'm going to get you for that. I can't believe you did that. Especially when they embarrassed you in front of everybody. You know? They'll grab you up and take you out here. And, you know? But Jesus doesn't do it. He doesn't, he doesn't deal with that way. Why? Because he took all our punishment already on the cross. 
So when he deals with this, with chastening of any kind, it's for correction, it's for growth, it's for maturing, it's because he loves us. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 12, when you read that about chastening, read it today. He talks about how much he's a father, and he's a, he's a good father, and he's the best father, and he loves you. And now he does it because he, in fact, it says he loves you and cherishes you, it says there. He, he cares for you, and so he'll deal with your life because he doesn't want you wrecking yourself. And, and left to ourselves, most of us will make a wreck out of our life, Amen. He doesn't want you to do that. So he deals with you in, in a very special way to draw you to himself. And sometimes, as it was in this situation, sickness because of sin. He said, don't do it anymore. Don't go back there. Whatever it was he did, and I think he knew exactly what Jesus was talking about. And you say, well, does that mean I'm never going to sin again? No. You've heard me say it before. When you choose to follow Jesus on a daily and regular basis in your life, you won't be sinless, but you will sinless. You won't be sinless, but you will sin less. And you'll have a sensitivity about your life so that when sin does enter in, you know, you'll, you'll do what God wants you to do. You'll quit operating by the feelings mode and start operating by the sensitive discernment, I love Jesus mode. And how much of our life is by the feelings mode? We react instead of respond. We get angry. We get an unforgiving spirit. We want to lash out. We want to, well, they said that to me, I'll say it to them. They did this, so I'll do that. You know, they pulled out in front of me, so I'm going to lay on my horn and pull up behind them and bump their bumper, you know, whatever it might be. Because I feel like it. You move out of that immaturity of life, and you move into a new realm of life, which is called loving Jesus and surrendering to Christ. And God says to you, go and sin. Don't live that way anymore. Now, here's the thing about it. Some people say, well, what could be worse than 38 years by the pool of Bethesda? Every time you see the water move, you start moving, somebody beats you to it. That's a frustrating, miserable way to live your life. I don't remember who said it, but I think it's appropriate. It goes something like this. You never miss what you haven't had. All right? But once you've had it, and then you're without it, you're never the same. Put it this way. You never miss the anointing on your life of the Holy Spirit if you've never had it. You never miss the joy of the Lord if you've never had it. You never miss, you never miss the peace of God if it's never been a part of your heart. But once you've known those things and you know what revival's like and you know what walking with God's like and you know what, you know what surrender's like and you're not there, then you, you're miserable. You're not the same. And there's so many illustrations I could give you this today. But for lack of time, I won't. I think the Holy Spirit's able to put that in your heart, what that means to you in your life. But there's this element here. I don't want to go back to what I was. I don't want to be where I was. I want to be where God wants me to be. I want to be what God wants me to be. And a choice has to be made in my life. It starts with desire. and comes obedience. And then remember... Sin will destroy you. Sin always robs you. Remember what it did to you in the past. Remember where it takes you each time. That's why you forsake that. You don't want to be there again. There's no life there. There's no victory there. There's no joy there. Nothing but condemnation and defeat. So if the Spirit of God speaks to you today and says, do you want to be made whole? Then I say you should respond and say, yes, Lord, I do. Now, we'll say this about this passage where he says something worse. There's a lot of things worse, folks, in the matters of life. Especially, there's a lot of things worse when you're not living for Jesus that can happen in your life. I believe that God deals with us as sons, as the Scripture says. I believe that God will chasten me. It works very simply as a warning. That's what conviction is. God says, hey, don't go that direction. It's going to create. Or the way you're moving now, the direction you're going in, you're headed for trouble. And so the Holy Spirit comes and convicts us. The word is being preached. The conviction comes. And from a loving God that cares for you. And at that point of that conviction, I can respond and say, yes, Lord, do what he's called me to do and turn from it. Or if I don't, what happens then? The Bible says in Hebrews 12, not only is he chasing us, he will scourge us if necessary. Scourging is when, that, like this guy, the sickness, the deeper thing. But remember, not all sickness is. But there are some times that it is. All right? And in fact, the Bible says in 1 John 5, for the children of God, there is a sin unto death. What does that mean? In other words, it's just only so far God's going to let you drift in your sin until he puts the brakes on and he takes you home early. I've done funerals for people I believe who went home early. 
Why? Because the scripture says, I'm not going to let you trample underfoot the blood of Jesus. What is the most valuable thing in the universe? Is it not the precious blood of Jesus? It's, by, it's what was used to purchase us, to cleanse us. The most prized thing of heaven in value is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Many, many years ago, and I, I may have shared this illustration once at least in five years, and I'll close with this. Coming in from a rally I'd been preaching at, northeast side of town, went to the church that I was a member of, and we unloaded the band and everything there, and we were packing up to leave, and everybody left. I was one of the last guys to leave, and as I, as I left, there'd been an accident on the highway, and all kinds of commotion was going on, and a guy had been jogging or walking by the road, and a car had come along and hit him and killed him. His father was out there in the street. They'd taken the body up. The father was out there washing the blood off the street. They tried to get him out. He wouldn't do it. He said, I'm not going to let these cars just drive over the blood of my son. How much more so the Heavenly Father who loves you so dearly, who when we willfully, disobediently reject his will and word for our life and sin, it's like trampling underfoot. It's no big deal. I'll do what I want to do. Live how I want to live. He not allows us to trample underfoot the precious blood of the Lamb. So I think if we can see ourselves and be honest with ourselves and see what our sin does and see what God wants to do, then the obligation makes a lot of sense. Would you stand with your heads bowed today? Invitation is very simple. If you'd like to know Jesus.